Good afternoon and welcome to this session, Diet and Room, where we're going to be talking about the instrumentalization of identity politics and continue our discussion that we've been having all day on COVID-19, um, linking COVID-19, democracy, and what is going on in East Africa. It is such a pleasure to be joined by three amazing panelists. Um, Joyce Nyairo, who is an independent researcher. Welcome, Joyce. Abubakar Zain, a cultural worker. Welcome, Abubakar. And Abdullahi Boru, Thank you. who is a of Africa policy analyst. Today, as we continue with the conversation, since we only have a very short time, we will not be taking questions from the panelists. But I do encourage you to share your thoughts and continue the conversation on um, social media. Um, if you go to the Kofi Annan Foundation, please tag us um, and we, you will be able to find all the hashtags that we are using over there. Also, please, um, we have a survey poll and it will be just great to hear from you as we continue with the conversation so that we can know how this session has been able to merge with your, your own thoughts. I'm going to go straight and just dive straight right into um, the conversation that we have today. Um, as we know, identity politics is a really, really big um, um, topic. Uh, but basically what we are interested in doing today is just to think about how um, politics founded in the shared realities and experiences of a particular social community that is associated with a particular identity is used, is instrumentalized, especially in relation to the conference theme, which is democracy in East Africa, and particularly at this moment in what we might describe as the COVID-19 season. Um, we could talk about what's happening today, and, and there are, I'm sure, a lot of things that we want to say towards that, but also we could also think about how this might influence us in the future. Well, without much ado, let me turn to our panelists. And I'm going to just invite you, perhaps if you could just off by sharing your, your very first preliminary thoughts when you saw this theme, divide and rule. And then you started to think about instrumentalization, identity politics, East Africa, democracy. What was at the forefront of your mind? Um, Dr. Joyce Nairo, may I start with you, please? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, when I saw this title against the, um, you know, the word COVID-19, I asked myself whether COVID-19 has itself become an identity, one of the ones that is being instrumentalized. And I asked myself how many conditions have been shut down with regard to COVID-19 because COVID-19 is the only thing that we can pay attention to or that we are hearing. And we've seen how uh, the political game has been played so that COVID-19 itself becomes an instrument of control. And that's really frightening without belittling the pandemic, without, um, you know, turning a blind eye to the suffering of those who are ill and those who are looking after them and the risks that they bear, has COVID-19 itself shrunk the space for democratic expression and, and existence? That's a powerful thought because, as you say, we don't think or do anything else without putting those words and even the question of democracy and COVID-19 in itself puts us in a particular space. Um, Abdullahi Boru, would you like to pick this up? Yeah, sure. I think for me, you know, a lot of the time uh, when I think about identity and politics in the region, one that comes to mind is the youth, where they are always cast either as a dividend or they are, they are, they are seen as a ticking time bomb. And just to expand on what uh, Dr. Joyce has said, uh, where now the youth, because they are the most active one, and the police and security agencies see them as a threat, and how COVID-19 has closed some of the spaces and opportunities for the youth, but also how now, you know, not all of them, obviously, but they have found another expression in space that is not necessarily online, as that is not necessarily um, offline, but online. But then again, the limitation that that presents, this is what sprang to mind when uh, this um, 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 uh, panel was constituted and I received the invite. Okay. So already you're thinking about a particular identity and, you know, you were speaking and I was thinking about how that could apply to women, that could apply um, to actually a whole range of different identities 
both the identities that are, we carry within us, but also identities that people impose on us. Um, Abu Bakr Zain, what were your thoughts when you first saw this um, title? When I saw this, I think uh, the uh, one thing that came to mind was um, the legacy of colonialism. And this uh, legacy of colonialism in terms of saying um, our countries were artificially created. And uh, part of that uh, artificial creation also um, leveraged um, ident creating social con constructs of identities, some leveraging old ones, some creating new ones. Uh, we know that um, um, the trajectory that um, uh, the previous of uh, using um, uh, social contexts to control people, um, to exploit people, um, and to keep them in, in check is something that uh, we inherited. But our nations also continue with that trajectory. So every time there is um, a, a new phenomena, uh, our leaders are looking for ways of saying, how can we use this new phenomena to continue with the trajectory of uh, justification of um, putting in place uh, social mechanisms that um, uh, control people. So uh, to me, uh, the divide and rule uh, um, dichotomy is, is about control. Mm -hmm. So if I take those thoughts and I bring them in relation to democracy, we know that East Africa, this is a season um, that is, you know, especially, especially very, a very active season with regard to democracy. Tanzania has just had an election. Uganda is preparing for an election. And in Kenya, we are always in election mode anyway, and we are always engaging on this issue of what's going on. And especially when we think about um, the possibility of a referendum and whether we're going to go into a form of voting and all that is happening, how do I bring, how do I think about this in relation to the questions of identity and the questions of how identity is particularly being deployed? Abdullah, I'm thinking of what you just said about youth and often youth are at the forefront of election, anything to do with election, whether it is um, in terms of mobilizing people, whether it is in terms of making certain sure certain people are not able to be in the rallies or to be in particular space. So let me start with you because you picked up on the question of um, youth. And then I'll hear also from what um, uh, Joyce and, and, and Abu Bakr have to say. I think the, the question around the youth is, is very interesting because a lot of the time, it's one demographic that is really at the forefront in terms of being mobilized and be mobilized and be appealed to. For instance, if you look at, you know, Yerim Seveni, um, he, he does push-ups, right? I mean, like he's doing, he's releasing his rap songs around um, th that appeals to this audience. If you look at, you know, in, in, in the case of Kenya, uh, William Ruto and Uhuru Kenyatta, they branded themselves as, you know, the, the dynamic duo. You know, there is something that is associated with active, you know, um, um, very progressive uh, or some somebody that is, you know, uh, is hashtag cool. But in reality, when you see that as a marketing tool rather than as a policy tool, it then becomes something that is just there for the taking. So uh, even some of the youthful members of parliament or politicians or leaders or cabinet secretaries that have been appointed, once they get into power, the idea that the youth, you know, the dy dynamism is completely subsumed in the daily realities of governing that doesn't appeal to the to the youth or to their to their needs. Um, you have, you know, Kazi Pavijana, at least uh, in Kenya, where it's essentially, you know, something that doesn't pass the test of being Kazi Pavijana per se. So for me, when, youth when, just, when they mobilize youth to do work projects, um, yes. go ahead. Kazi Pavijana is when they mobilize youth Kazi to do Kavijana. work projects. To, to, to do projects that are really not that useful. But then again, I have to step back a lot of the time and be careful not to flatten all the experiences of the youth. Uh, is somebody in northern part of Kenya who, yeah, for one reason or the other, who has not had an opportunity to go and, um, and go to school, 
is his experience similar to you know a young fisherman in Mombasa or somebody in other parts of the of, of the country? So so th there is a particularity that goes with being a youth, and then there are there are generalities. So a lot of the time, all that is lost when we flatten it. But for for the Kenyan government uh, or anybody who not necessarily Kenyan government, for most government, uh, that has been flattened atomized and you have you know brokers that sell youth that you know the the boys are coming to see the president or this current member of parliament or next member of parliament and now with the penetration of social media platforms you will see people donning different shirts identities and trying to support one line or the other i think it is very dynamic but at the same time once the electioneering period is over they uh, their function is done uh, they are put in political freezer to be activated again Okay, and so you're bringing in um, two things that I feel, I think, I mean, many things, but two things I think are particularly interesting. One is the fact that often we, um, people are put into only one box. And so your identity is reduced to one thing and e everything to do with the politics of the moment, you're only seen as only being able to think in one particular little box. And then the other one is the way we, in which we often reduce democracy to elections. And so people are mobilized purely in terms of their votes. I wonder if Joyce or Abu Bakr, you would want to share some thoughts um, that help us think through this question of democracy and identity politics. And then we can come to the question of COVID-19, the particular season that we're in. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think if I could jump in, um, you know, because Dr. Moro put it very well, you, the issue of um, voter behavior I think this should always be of concern to us, um, not only because, um, as he puts it, of the, the, how easy it is to mobilize young people in a cause for a particular season, but also because um, the fundamental question we must look at all the time, even as we create spaces for young people to be heard and young people actually to lead, is where do they get their examples from? You know, how easily um, they become what was there before them should frighten us. Indeed, it is frightening, but that is because there's a vacuum there. And I'll never tire of talking about the value of civic education, because I think that uh, this is really what is not happening. It is about uh, preparation, not imitation. And I think we need to create enough room for both the preparation and as well for good examples for young people to, to look up to. So I think this for me is the main thing, is how we link this question of voter behavior um, to what they themselves should become and how we create the processes for them to do that. So seeing this also as a, a, a process of maturing citizens, maturing people in the sense of being able to fully take on all their roles and all their responsibilities. And you're so right. I'm also thinking about that in relation to um, as a woman, what often, you know, you're told as a woman, this is what you, the expectations are, and this is who you should aspire to be or aspire to become. Abu Bakr Zain, I'm going to ask this in a slightly different way to you, because I know you've been doing a lot of work on elections. I know you've served on election, a couple of election monitoring observation um, in the past, as well as in the present. And I'm wondering how this question of identity politics um, perhaps has shifted or is continuing to shift, especially when you think about a time when you have so much, so many of the limitations that we have in a season such as the one that we're in. Yeah, so um, I think one, one of the clear um, uh, pattern you see is that politicians find it much easier to deal with questions of divisions of uh, we and them dividing people on uh, very basic um, uh, emotions and uh, leveraging um, uh, nuances of perceptions um, and, and um, activating their base based on those nuances. Um, I'll give you an example of what you raised in terms of the uh, elections um, in the region. You, you will see, and uh, like um, the previous uh, speakers uh, have said, you will see that um, it is easy to exploit the youth, partly because of the high levels of poverty in our region, but the levels of inequality. So many, many of the people who are outside the state uh, functions would use the issue of inequality um, and that 
uh, we are being uh, discriminated upon. And, and that's a reality. So the, the questions of saying um, uh, leveraging emotions and, and uh, working on um, hate, for example, or working on um, the perceptions that we have been excluded and now it's our turn to, to have a chance. And then if you look at this within the context of the winner-take-all um, uh, uh, systems that we have in our region, then it, it becomes the, the stakes are raised very high. And when the stakes are very high, of course, the emotions also go high. And, and in the end, um, uh, those in power in, in our region uh, exploit uh, these differences and, and um, label uh, those who are trying to challenge their rule as people who are spoilers, uh, people who want to disturb peace and, and security, and, and then um, uh, uh, use authoritarian tactics to um, uh, unleash violence, which then tames and, and directs um, their, their actions towards a particular outcome. So um, uh, elections and violence in our region uh, go hand in hand, and like um, Dr. Boru said, uh, the issue of um, uh, the youth uh, using their uh, energy and, and availability to be part of that, and then connecting it to what uh, Dr. Um, 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 uh, Eros said, that because there is lack of orientation to civic understanding of duties and responsibilities and rights, then it becomes very difficult for the youth to have a free will in, in the participation of elections. Thank you very much. I'd like to start to think about this present moment. Um, but before we go there, I, I see a question from the audience. And this one I do want to bring, even though I said we wouldn't be taking questions. When we think of East Africa, would we say that Tanzania has been much more successful in creating a national identity that subsumes all these other identities? And if so, why is it unique? Why, the question is, you know, why was Nyerere's strategy of creating a common national identity as for independence not followed through by other countries? Any one of you who has some thoughts on that? I'll probably take only one or two responses and then move on to the season. Uh, uh, my, my personal thoughts are as follows. One, I think, uh, given the context of um, the struggle for independence in Tanzania, um, they, they were using uh, Kiswahili um, a lot more than um, the other countries in the struggle. Kiswahili was used as an instrument of uniting um, uh, all those who are involved in the struggle against uh, colonialism. But immediately after um, uh, independence, uh, Mwalim Nyerere uh, demobilized uh, ethnic uh, organizing. And, and actually, the, the, the government of Tanzania banned uh, chief, chieftains and demobilized. But the third element was, of course, um, an ideological um, organizing uh, uh, based on Ujama and, and, and using of politics based on ideology. Um, I must add, unfortunately, um, this is changing now. Um, uh, they, they, they are now coping us. Instead of um, continuing uh, with, with, uh, with that ideological leaning, they are now coping us and they are leaving their legacy behind. You recall that um, it, is, it is only Tanzania still that, that has a, um, an experiment of a union in the continent. All the other unions in the continent um, disintegrated. It's only Tanzania, meaning Tanganyika and Zanzibar. They have their challenges. They have um, uh, their, their, their pushbacks, but that's the only union that we know. So um, it's unfortunate that they're moving towards now the politics of things instead of uh, the politics of uh, Utu or uh, the philosophy of the dignity of um, every human being. And so then I think that's a perfect way to then talk about then this present moment. What is it that it enables? What is it that we have to be worried about? Um, what is it that 
this season, and I'm thinking beyond the fact, as Joyce pointed out, that um, COVID-19 has been so central in terms of um, changing the way we think about so many things, but it also enables certain things and it also limits certain things. So what are our opportunities? What are our possibilities? What are the things we need to fear? Dr. Borum, may I start with you? Yeah, I think one of the things that has been very clear, at least um, with COVID, at least from, from where I sit, um, nobody is safe. You know, I saw yesterday you know, uh, the former director of um, uh, medical services, Dr. Uh, Nikal, crying how they felt very desperate as members of parliament. I think this is just the centrality of public health in what we do. We can have, you know, we can we can disagree, you know, have um, uh, I, I, I agree that because you have got, you know, public health insurance through your your employee, you can have you can go and attend, you know, public hospitals. But the reality is, we cannot run away from uh, public how public and central public health is, and public health again, you know, it goes beyond just the the clinical part of it. It, it involves so many other things that are linked, and there is no way you can separate this from, from politics. We can have our debates on whether this is done at the national level, on whether this can be done at the, you know, at the sub-national level. The reality is, is the centrality of public health in everything that we do, and nobody is safe. I think that is one thing that I will take away from COVID, because with even with all the money that they have, they you know, uh, the wealthy and well-to-do cannot travel. The second one that I would want to add, and I don't want to take much of the time, is the role of, you know, control. You know, state agencies, particularly the police, have been central to how people are controlled. So there are people who are controlled, there are people who are not controlled, and then again, it all comes to politics, and then it leads to, you know, election and governance. Um, I, I would want to vacate the floor for, for, for my other colleagues. Thank you very much. So it, it, there's a kind of leveling that happens that makes us think beyond the divides into a place where we are all united. And, and some of that is also about being in that place is also about being oppressed. And that leads then to this bigger question of democracy outside elections. Dr. Nyairo, what might your thoughts be? Um, to add into that. Yeah, I, th I think that the moment, um, in as much as our humanity has collectively been called into question, because this has been the most important thing, that everybody is vulnerable. But without doubt, I think COVID-19 has also showed up um, a lot of the inequalities, because you cannot argue that everybody is affected in the same way. That is not true. And so what has happened is that societies um, have been shown up for their failures. Um, those who we forget, at the level of government, at the level of government, those that governments forget. Um, I think it has been a moment for us to think about providing better. And sadly, this is not happening. I mean, you've had ridiculous things like members of parliament in Kenya asking for a helicopter and standby to take them to a well-equipped hospital should they fall ill. So we are not learning the lessons. And, and this is really, really frightening. Instead of using this moment for the way in which it has magnified difference, um, the way in which it has shown up weak healthcare systems, weak social infrastructure, uh, weak safety nets. Instead of seeing that, people are still only seeing, or rather those who make the decisions that are most important at this point, are still only seeing how their privilege can be entrenched. And that's a really frightening thing. We really have to um, think about how, because the political class, I don't think will ever hear us. So maybe we leave them alone as one peculiar identity that can't be cured. And we come really to think about the electorate as a place where there is hope to see one another, to listen to one another, and to begin to understand identity as intersectionality, not as peculiar difference, but actually um, to try and see those areas that come together and that must be seen in confluence and to understand that identity is fluid. I think it always bothers me that we don't talk about the fluidity of identity enough and about the multiplicity of it. So personally, I have given up on the political class learning the lessons, whether you're talking about Kenya or you're talking about Uganda or Tanzania. We've seen the growing dictatorship in Tanzania and in Uganda. Forget about the political class. We have to work on the electorate as the people that can make the difference and that can begin to shape a set of, of views. That's, that's really how I feel and think. 
intersectionality, multiplicity of identities. That's powerful. Abu Bakr Zain, Mr. Zain, please. What are your thoughts? Some of the uh, threats, uh, some of the opportunities. Two things. Two, two things. Um, the first one is uh, how do we reverse the shrinking democratic space that was um, further shrunk by the responses, the security responses of our nations in East Africa? Um, and they, they have clawed back on many of the civil liberties that we, we have enjoyed or fought for for a long time. So how do we re re reverse um, uh, those excesses? But the second one, I think, uh, is, is just to emphasize some out of this discussion from Dr. Nyero, from Dr. Boro, in terms of the ingenuity of our people. Um, we talk a lot more about our differences, as Dr. Nyero is saying, or the social constructs of um, um, political class on exploitation of identity. But COVID-19 has taught us that many a time um, communities came together in the absence of God to find solutions for themselves and the kind of solidarity that has been built in um, neighborhoods that uh, have not had uh, services they are being told to wash their hands but there's no water um, has been amazing so one of the strengths i think we need to be able to examine uh, the kind of uh, responses community responses outside government um, in terms of um, building solidarity among themselves and working together to find simple solutions for themselves. Thank you. I know we've talked a lot about what communities can do, and that's really powerful, and I think that has to be the driver. And maybe we don't have as much help, hope for the political actors, but if we could give one policy recommendation or two policy short recommendations for policy actors, things that could be done um, in this moment that would change um, the way we think about democracy, the way we practice democracy in East Africa. What are some of those things? What is it that you might want us to, 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 to go away with, to carry away with as we, as we close this session? Dr. Nyairo? Yes, every public officer must use public institutions for mm. themselves, for their families. You make decisions on these institutions, you must be the user. That is what will transform those hospitals, those schools, all of those public facilities. Therefore, all of us. Let's start with the leaders. That's powerful. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Boru. Um, I think strengthening public institutions. Um, I think to me, that is one thing that we've taken for granted, even when we know that there are some things that COVID doesn't affect all of us the same way, you know. All of us are, are, are dealing with COVID in different ways that we could, but strengthening public institution, they are not doing anybody a favor when the politicians and leaders and policymakers strengthen these institutions. They are doing themselves a favor. I really like the way Dr. Nyeri said that we've given up on them. At the very minimum, we've given up on you. You can go to a private hospital, but ensure that you can get your helicopter. I'm not saying they should, but if you get that, leave us not uh, you know stuff that are that, that are not meant for humans strengthen public hospitals and public schools just to take one final example of kenya imagine if they had given the laptops and strengthened the broadband some of the problems that we have could be could 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 be addressed i'm not saying they would be uh, dealt with completely because somebody living in interior in turkana and garissa or Chandondo in Uganda might not be able to access it, but at the very minimum, they have dealt with that. So strengthen public institutions. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Boru. Mr. Bubakadu? Mr. Bubakadu? Yes. Yes, I, I think just to add, I think uh, let's go back to the basics. We mentioned in health, in education, basically about uh, uh, big infrastructural projects. Let's go back to the very simple basic things and investing in uh, preventive medicine and, and in, in, in providing basic needs 
for citizens. So the services end of it is also important. I want to thank all of you for joining us, all the participants. Please remember to please um, answer the poll before you leave. I really, really want to thank our three panelists, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr Zain, who is a cultural um, expert, a cultural uh, uh, practitioner, Dr. Abdullah Boru, who is a Horn of Africa policy analyst, and Dr. Joyce Nyairu, who is an independent researcher. Your thoughts have been powerful. We need to think intersectionality. We need to think the multiplicity of identities. We need to move beyond the boxes that we are put in. We need to make sure that public servants use public institutions, and that would be a foundation to strengthening those public institutions. And then we all need to work together to make sure that this moment that we are in, in COVID-19, becomes a springboard to a new future where we see a more vibrant democracy in East Africa. Thank you very, very much once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.